Ephesians 2.8, Romans 13.11. We are pure in Christ. Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. That's the epitome of irony. To tell an unleavened lump of dough, clean out the old leaven. Our citizenship is in heaven and everything on the earth belongs to us. If you're not a paradox, you're not saved. As I've pondered my father's life, I have found him to be a very paradoxical person. He's a Christian, he's human. Does it not seem strange and incongruous? Maybe not a real incongruity, you judge. That a blood earnest soul winner who hammered away at the temptations of the world and the dangers of the flesh should celebrate the body of his wife with a poem like this. Her hair is like an auburn sea, wind-whipped, waved, mysterious. Her forehead, like a wall of pearl, stands majestic, proud, serene. Her wide-set eyes are like clear, sparkling, hazel-green pools, calm, compassionate, penetrating. Her fine, chiseled nose stands firmly between cheeks that are fair like pillows of down. Her mouth is soft, pleasant, ruby-rich. Her skin is like the feathers of a dove. Her breasts are like rose-tipped apples of ivory, and her belly is like an ocean wave, smooth and restful. Her legs are like pillars of granite, strong and firm, and her feet like those of a deer, swift and beautiful. Her breath is like sweet nectar, her kisses like perfumed flowers, and her love like paradise, written in his sixties. Perhaps I shouldn't be surprised that Bob Jones University should produce soul winners who write like the Song of Solomon. <laughs> Maybe the incongruity is just biblical faithfulness. But almost everywhere I turn in my father's life, I find paradoxes. He was a Christian. He lived with other Christians who created corporate paradoxes. Does it seem strange to you? Incongruous. Perhaps not a real one. You decide. That the most fundamentalistic, separatistic, worldliness-renouncing school in America, Bob Jones University, where my father graduated in 1942, should have as part of their commencement celebration in those days, every year, the performance of As You Like It, 1939, Roman, Romeo and Juliet, 1940, both written by William Shakespeare, who in his own day ridiculed the Puritans, and whose Globe Theater they demolished in, 19, in 1644. Isn't it strange? that 300 years can turn worldliness into a delightful comedy, as the Bob Jones brochure says. So, whether personal or corporate, my father's life is permeated with paradoxes. And under the title, Evangelist Bill Piper, fundamentalist, full of grace and joy, I want to capture some of them and give you hope in the grace of God through the gospel of Christ. William Solomon Hottle Piper, named after a not well-known but significant biblical expositor, William Hottle, was born January 8, 1919, 
third and youngest son of Elmer and Emma Piper. His father had been a machinist. He knew it because he was missing a finger. It's like that. So I remember about my granddad. granddad. He's missing a finger until he was saved. And then he became a self-taught Bible student and the pastor of West Wyoming non-sectarian church, as we call. I have a picture of him laying the cornerstone. My father told me that he would not have been surprised if, if his father could have recited the entire New Testament from memory. Probably an overstatement, but making a point. Namely, his father counted the Bible as supremely valuable and gave himself to it. My father counted the Bible as supremely valuable. I count the Bible as supremely valuable and therefore it runs in the family so far and I praise God for it. His upbringing was old-fashioned, no-nonsense, and strict. Elmer, Harold, Bill, he gives a glimpse like this. My father, if you wonder where I'm getting these quotes, got scads of tapes, CDs now there, and I've got seven of his books, collections of sermons. So everything I quote from him is, if, I'll, if it's from memory, I'll tell you. Otherwise, it's straight out of, out of things that he said or wrote that are recorded or written. He wrote, Behavioristic psychologists teach that temper tantrums and defiant attitudes are normal and healthy. To curb them is dangerous. If you discipline the child, you will develop within him inhibitions and warp his personality. Well, I'm glad I had a father who believed otherwise. I got warped a good many times. <laughs> but it wasn't my personality. Oh, yes. We had plenty of counseling sessions, but generally he did all the talking. And when he was finished, I said, yes, sir. Old-fashioned, indeed it was, scriptural, absolutely, right to the letter. I was reared in a family with three boys. To this day, I can hear some of the neighbors in the church saying, Brother Piper, you're just too hard on your boys. Nevertheless, all three are following Christ. And two of them are Baptist preachers. There was no doing as you please in our home. My father believed he was responsible for the behavior of his children. And as long as we were under his roof, we were expected to obey. Here's the way he narrates his early conversion. That children can be saved, I know from my own experience, I have a brother who was saved at the age of seven, and another gave his heart to Christ when he was eight. I received Christ as my Savior when I was a boy of six. Certainly, there were many things I did not know, nor need to know. I knew enough to be saved. I knew I was sinful, needed a Savior. I knew that Christ was the Savior I needed. I knew that I would believe, if I would believe on Him and confess Him as my Savior, He would save me. That's all I needed to know and all any child needs to know to be saved. I trusted Christ and He saved me. The most decisive event, as I judge it, in reading and thinking and listening of His young life was His uh, call to the ministry. Uh, happened when he was 15, and it went like this. Let's put the slide up while I narrate this so you can see what he looked like. This is the closest I could get. This is a year before I'm talking about. Okay, it's 33, he's 14 in that picture, and he's 15 when this story that he narrates happens. I can vividly recall the thrills that accompanied the delivery of my first gospel sermon. I was 15 years of age and had just surrendered my life fully to the will and the service of Christ. The young people of our community had joined together to promote a citywide revival and had invited a well-known evangelist. For the Saturday night service, the evangelist decided to turn over the entire service to the young people. For some reason, I was asked to bring the message and to give the invitation. I had been reared in a Baptist parsonage all my life. I had heard great preaching, but I had never tried to do it myself. This was to be my first attempt. I didn't know how, but I tried. My heart was filled with zeal, and I wanted to 
do my best for the Lord 